All right, I hope everybody is well. I want to wish everybody a happy 4th of July. Uh, today is July 4th, 2020. And I wanted to read the last couple paragraphs from Rene Girard's Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. This will be a quick video where he puts forth a uh, solution in a sense, or he opens up a space for um, a baton pass for, for future thinkers to um, wrestle with what what the ideas are put forth in the book. Um, finally, here in this conclusion, he's juxtaposing or he's coming up with a, a third third way forward um, out of the predicament that we find ourselves in from the um, inability to return back to a traditional modernity, uh, sacrificial reading of Christianity, which he puts forth, and also the, um, uh, the postmodern ethic and situation we find ourselves in with the deconstruction of the Western metaphysical tradition as a whole. So he's going he's gonna to set up a framework here for a potential way forward. Um, so I wanted to share this quick reading for you with you here. It's literally the last two pages in the book. So he says... <clears throat> That is the most remarkable thing about it, so it seems to me. On the one hand, there is a complete cleavage, and on the other, there is a continuity which is capable of reconciling us with the past of all humankind, not to mention the present. The sight of our own culture, which does not deserve either the excessive praise once heaped upon it or the bitter condemnation directed against it today. Surely it is extraordinary that most radical perspective that the most radical perspective on our cultural history should finally turn out to be the only tolerant and favorable one, the one that is by, that is far removed as possible from the absurd scorched earth policy Western intellectuals have practiced for more than a century. I see this as being the height of good fortune and, in a sense, the height of humor as well. Traditional Christian thinkers could proclaim the cleavage between Christianity and everything else, but they were incapable of demonstrating it. Anti-Christian thinkers can note the continuity, but they are unable to come to terms with its true nature. Among our contemporaries, only Paul Ressois, particularly in his fine work La Symbolique de Mal, is willing to argue with determination that both positions are necessary. The non-sacrificial reading of the Judeo-Christian scriptures and the thinking that takes the scapegoat as its basis are capable of coming to terms with the apocalyptic dimension of present times without relapsing into frightened hysteria about the end of the world. They make us see that the present crisis is not an absurd dead end into which we have been pitched by a scientific error in calculation. Interpreting the present in this way is not an attempt to force outdated meanings on mankind's new situation, nor is it a desperate attempt to stop new meanings from coming across. There is simply no need for frivolous expedience, expediences of this kind. We have carved out such a strange destiny for ourselves so that we can bring to light both what has always determined human culture and what is now the only path open to us, one that reconciles without excluding anyone and no longer has any dealings with violence. In the light of the non-sacrificial reading, the crisis of the present day does not become in any way less threatening, but it does take on some hope for the future, which means a genuinely human significance. A new kind of humanity is in the process of gestation, it will be both very similar and to similar to and very different from the one featured in the dreams of our, of our utopian thinkers now in their very last stages. We are now absolutely unable to understand, and for a long time we shall still only stand, understand very inadequately the basis of mankind's suffering and the way of setting mankind free. But we can already see that there is no point in condemning one another or maligning our past. Here he's, he's, he's uh, in discussion with someone in this chapter. So his interlocutor here states, what strikes me particularly is the way in which the mimetic in the victimary hypothesis always ends up by rejecting the twin forms of extremism. Its own radicalism frees it from the false oppositions present day thinking cannot slough off. Where desire is concerned, to take one example, it liberates us from the mystic terror, the purely maleficent form of sacralization that dominated centuries of Puritanism and was then followed by a beneficent sacralization, first in surrealism and a certain direction of Freudianism, Freudianism 
And in our own day, the whole with a whole host of epigonal movements so devoid of real creativity that they seem more pathetic than dangerously misleading. And Gerard again, finally, <clears throat> and this is the passage that I wanted to drive home, these last three paragraphs. What is important above all is to realize that there are no recipes. There is no pharmacon anymore, not even a Marxist or psychoanalytic one. Recipes are, recipes are not what we need, nor do we need to be reassured or need our need is to escape from meaninglessness. However large, however large a part of sound and fury signifying nothing there may be in the public and private suffering, in the anguish of mental patience, in the deprivations of the poor, and in the rivalries of politics, these things are not lacking in significance, if only because at each moment they are open to the ironic reversal of the judgment against the judge that recalls the implacable functioning of the gospel law in our world. We must learn to love this justice, which we both carry out and fall victim to. The peace that passes human understanding can only arise on the other side of this passion for justice and judgment, which still possesses us, but which we are less and less likely to confuse with the totality of being. I hold that truth is not an empty word or a mere effect as people say nowadays. I hold that everything capable of diverting us from madness and death from now on is inextricably linked with this truth. But I do not know how to speak about these matters. I can only approach texts and institutions, and relating them to one another seems to me to throw light in every direction. I am not embarrassed to admit that an ethical and religious dimension exists for me, but it is the result of my thinking rather than an external pre preconception that determined my research. This, this sentence right here. Right? I have always believed that if I managed to communicate what some of my reading meant to me, the conclusions I was forced to reach would force themselves on other people as well. I began to breathe more freely when I discovered that literary and ethnological critiques are inadequate, even if they are not totally worthless when confronted with the literary and cultural texts they claim to dominate. This was before I came to the Judeo-Christian scriptures. I never even ima imagined that those texts were there for the purpose of passive enjoyment, in the same way as we look at a beautiful landscape. I always cherished the hope that meaning and life were one. Present-day thought is leading us in the direction of the valley of death, and it is the cataloging, and it is cataloging dr the dry bones one by one. All of us are in this valley, but it is up to us to resuscitate meaning by relating all the texts to one another without exception, rather than stopping at just a few of them. All issues of quote-unquote psychological health seem to me to take second place to a much greater issue, that of meaning, which is being lost or threatened on all sides, but simply awaits the breath of the spirit to be reborn. Now all that is needed is this breath to recreate stage by stage Ezekiel's experience in the valley of the dead. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me, he led me round among them, and behold, there were very many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh, Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and you will, uh, and you will, and will cause you, will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Thanks for listening.